Hi, this is Jonathan Jay, and welcome to dealmakers.co.uk, the number one place for business buying information. And if you haven't joined my free training course on how to buy a business successfully, there is a link somewhere on this video. Take the course and I will teach you the essentials of buying a business successfully. Now on this video, I want you to meet John. John is an experienced deal maker. He sold a business a couple of years ago and recently he has bought six different businesses and I am going to pick his brains on exactly what he did and I hope you're going to learn a lot from it as well. Now if you haven't, like the video, subscribe to the channel, tap the notifications bell, enjoy the video. So John, you've done six acquisitions in your new group and taken it from zero to 2.5 million in annual revenue with another acquisition lined up, ready to go, and I'm sure many more to, to come to follow. I want to discover from you what you've learned from that. And also, I understand, doing 150 discovery calls with owners. So big question to start off with. What have you learned? Okay, so the um, I think every anybody going out there doing discovery calls is going to be a little bit nervous about um, what people are like. So the majority are actually entirely reasonable, um, nice to talk to. Uh, yes, a little bit edgy, a bit nervous. Uh, one of the big ones I've learned is if you start off on a hostile foot or semi-hostile foot from the conversation from the other side, you might as well walk away straight away. Um, what do I, you mean if the other side's a bit hostile? Yeah, or, or over-defensive. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I have actually got close to doing a deal with one of those and it ended up pulling out just before completion. So, And all my instincts were saying, this feels wrong, this feels wrong, and I didn't follow them. So... Oh, that's interesting. So you do actually listen to your instincts when you're when you're doing calls like this. Absolutely, I think yeah. it's really important. Really yeah, important. very good. Yeah. I, I mean, I I think that if someone is difficult to do business with in that very first conversation, it doesn't bode well for the far trickier part of the relationship when you're negotiating money. Yeah, and if they're unreasonable at the beginning, it'll come back. If you think you've dealt with it, in my experience is it comes mm. back. So a classic was um, um, they uh, uh, one of the people talk, talked about red lines, and one of them was a defined value for a property, but not based on a formal valuation. And we explained why that wasn't reasonable. We thought we'd got over it. And then a week before completion, mm -hmm. they reintroduced it as a red line. <laughs> right, right, so we, got it. So we walked away at that point. They then tried to reopen negotiations. We said, no, sorry, that's it. Interesting, interesting. So, so... I suppose the benefit of having deal flow mm -hmm. is that you can walk away at any time. Yeah, and the amusing thing is they don't believe you. What a surprise, because anybody doing what we're doing is, is dodgy, aren't they? But um, it, it feels good saying that, which I have done recently, um, and it's genuine. We'll have another one completing in either the same slot or a month after they would have completed. Um, and uh, the work was going on behind. So that I think the deal flow and the negotiation flow before that yes. make a huge difference to um, how you feel in the process. You're not reliant on just one thing happening. So would you say, and I'm not sure of the answer to this, but would you say you're quite unemotional about this? Detached? No. No, I wouldn't say that. Um, like anybody, if it's a frustrating day, I show it. Um, okay. And... Uh, Anybody that thinks they're going into business and not having the odd uh, stressful moment is dreaming um, mm -hmm. sort of thing. Um, but the uh, I, I enjoy it. I enjoy the interaction with people a lot. That's part of why I got into this. Um, and I like negotiating um, sort of thing. So um, does it matter if one walks away? As long as you've got the deal flow, not really. Um, not really, um, because it's not the right time for them. And just give everyone a, a flavour of your background, your business background, because you're you're kind of doing this as something to occupy you and, and, and give you a, a challenge, aren't you? This is a retirement project. Yes. <laughs> so the um, I'm working part-time, and the background is I've built two other businesses, one of which did 
pretty well, sold it in February 2020 mm -hmm. um, in the technology sector. And the options were voluntary work, non-executive director somewhere, or do something that was proactive. And I talked to people who'd done non-executive director, and I had some views about it before the conversation and just thought, that's just not for me, right, um, right. that sort of thing. or well, certainly not at the moment anyway. And uh, I, I've really enjoyed doing what I'm doing. What, the acquisitions? Yeah. yeah. So, so what is it about it that you, that you enjoy most? Building something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So building something. And um, this time, slightly different, because last time I was mainly operational. So I was actually managing the business. And obviously in the early part, I got involved in some of that. Um, the first couple of deals, you, it's almost inevitable. But... Um, the uh, partly what I'm doing now is mentoring people through um, who are new to being directors of bigger businesses. Um, okay. Sort of thing. So part okay. of that's that's quite inter I'm enjoying. Interesting. That Interesting. So let's come to some of the lessons that you've learned mm -hmm. that you can share with with others because um, I know uh, because you you've been a mastermind and uh, and in a circle you you are analytical about the deals and what works and what doesn't work. And I think that's one of your strengths is that you, you do analyze you know, what makes something work. Yeah. So what makes a deal work? Very general starter question. And what makes a deal not work? Okay. So um, deal works is, um, and I think one of the things you taught uh, was motivated seller. But motivated sellers also motivated, if you get the deal structure on deferred consideration, is also motivated that it continues to work. Um, so, And they understand right. that. Um, ones that don't work, and I've had one, um, It was uh, uh, they'd had a really bad experience. So we bought it after their really bad experience, probably shouldn't have done. And they'd had a big contract uh, walk away, no fault of theirs. It was based on tiny amounts of money uh, that they lost the contract, nothing to do with poor service. But they'd had to restructure their business, move premises, get rid of loads of people. So in that business, everybody was demotivated. So within two months, the reception team had gone. <laughs> to the and, and that's very important in your sector. Uh, have we mentioned your sector? I don't think, I we, don't have, think we have. I don't think we have, no. So I'm buying osteopathic and physiotherapy practices. Yeah. Um, over two hundred fifty mil, uh, two hundred fifty thousand turnover. So, mm -hmm. so that practice management receptions team, the, yeah. the front, you know, uh, what do you call them, front of house yeah, staff, yeah, yeah. that they, they are actually very important to the success of the business. Absolutely, aren't they? and they quite often have um, part of the therapy is, is the conversation with with the receptionist, <laughs> um, sort of thing. So, um, the uh, but also the owner decided on the consultancy agreement to take two months off right uh, and she was at that point um the last remaining fee earner <laughs> oh really so we did deal with that um fairly robustly but um uh it, it just sh and the, but what's behind all that was she was demotivated too yeah uh, so that if if the underlying strength of the business if it's had a big slump um, I would say don't don't deal with it for a good eighteen months until it's recovered. Um, would be a big oh, lesson. So, so if the business has been through a slump, w wait for it to not just recover, but to forget that the slump ever happened. Unless it's technical, um, and the, but the, in this, there are a lot of people had gone. Uh, we found it very difficult to get goodwill with the people that were remaining for obvious right. reasons, um, uh, and uh, which wasn't the case in the stable. Uh, businesses that we bought interesting so so out of these six acquisitions how do you grade them you know what what makes the best one the best what makes the worst one the worst okay the best one wasn't what we thought would be the best one and the best one was the one where the uh, workforce stayed the most stable oh interesting uh, because it meant the revenues carried on quite nicely you know what i i i so agree with that because i i had quite a few where it was 
it was unstable from the very first day, <laughs> quite often initiated by the exiting owner, yeah. who went and said something stupid to the staff. Yeah. You know, good luck, guys, you're going to need it. So, you know, one, <laughs> one sentence, one phrase. And, yeah. and then before you know it, they're off yeah, getting jobs elsewhere, and then it all starts to, to collapse. Yeah, and the, the nightmare one I described um, was on an earnout, so we thought, as in they would they could increase what they were getting, uh, so we thought that would motivate them. It really didn't, because of what they'd been through. Right. So it wasn't about the money anymore. No, it was just get out of here. I've had enough, yeah. and that was not a great recipe for for moving it forward. We have turned it around. Mm-hmm. We didn't shut it down. It did go into loss making temporarily, and that really does suck the cash. Yes, big time. I'm interrupting your video with a very important message. If you are watching a video like this, it's probably because you're serious about buying a business. But watching free videos on YouTube will only take you so far. You need to take the next step. And the next step is a link that's somewhere on the screen up at the top, uh, which takes you through to our free video training. There's no cost whatsoever. You watch the free video training and that will give you some of the essential basics that you need. Now, if you get value from that, then I would invite you to be part of my next fast track program. Now, the fast track program has been running for a couple of years now. We've had nearly 3000 people around the world on the fast track program. And it's a Zoom program that you can attend from anywhere. Uh, It's broadcast from my living room to your living room, where I will teach you what you need to know to go and buy your first business. And there's a QA and a section at the end of each of the training sessions. So you can ask me all of your questions. Now, if you get great value from that and you're really serious about buying a business, then there's my mastermind program, a 12 month program where we hold your hand through the business buying process so that you can buy your first company. And when you have, I'll invite you into our inner circle, which is exclusively for people who've bought their first business. So that's what we've got lined up for you. It's up to you whether you take the next step. Anyway, back to the video. Yeah, you don't want, if you're building a, a group of multiple businesses, yeah. you don't want many that do that no. because then it starts to negate the profitability elsewhere, doesn't yeah. it? You're just oh, moving yeah. money around. Exactly. Interesting. And I think, um, yeah, you, you can have an owner who is very motivated to exit uh, for other reasons, you know, for health and retirement typically are the, are the main ones, aren't they? But if it's, I'm very motivated to leave because this business is about to collapse any minute. That's the wrong motivation. Unless you're doing what John does, so you're looking at um, distressed businesses. I wasn't looking for that. Um, so um, the I was. So, I, so let me just explain who John is. So jo- yeah. John is is part of our inner circle group. Our inner circle group of people who've all bought businesses already. Yeah. And his speciality is how to. Yeah, you know, is is buying businesses that are challenged, often via an administration. Yeah, uh, and he does it very well. I've got to, I've got to say, but it's not everyone's cup of tea. Uh, is it's it? definitely not my cup of tea, and I'll take my hat off to him. But you know, there's a place for it, mm-hmm. and uh, he's doing a very good job. Uh, it used to be my cup of tea. It is no longer. <laughs> I, I get that. I get that. <laughs> I, I'm looking for an easier life. It's a, a young man's game. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. 30s to 40s. <laughs> yeah, I'm, sadly, I'm out of that uh, yeah, age, me, age, me a age, bit as well. age category. Uh, so um, tell us some some other things that our, our viewers and listeners can learn from, from your experience. Okay, so... Um, it's really important. Uh, we've left money on the table by not managing through fee increases quickly enough. So this is the pricing structure yeah. of the services offered by the business. Yeah, and in fact, I've just, uh, I might not have turned this one down, but I've just turned quite a decent, a very nice business down, uh, partly because they understand that they're worth quite a bit more than we want to pay. But also, um, they've already done all the things you would do to improve it. So there aren't any quick, any quick wins there. Um, but the uh, typically in my sector, the business owners are reluctant to charge a fair rate for what they actually do in yeah. their qualifications. Um, we probably left a hundred grand on the table by not putting fees up quickly enough. Which later, when you start to realise what you've done and catching up, is a lot harder than doing it as quickly as you can. 
So um, we're going through that process now. We did instruct fee increases. In some cases, they did it. In some cases, they didn't. Um, we didn't <laughs> manage this. that through properly. So, so, so you've told the manager of that practice yeah. to increase fees, yeah. assuming that telling them to do it was sufficient for it to happen. Yeah. And they didn't. Yeah. Um, and, I, you know, I take responsibility for that. We should have managed it through. Um, you know, it's it's a lesson learnt. Um, well, I mean, yeah. You know, in all fairness, you would hope that when the boss says <laughs> you need to put the prices up, that they go away and put the prices. And, and I think sometimes it's because people feel as though, uh, well, I wouldn't pay that. They yeah. put them. They they think that they are the customer, and they're and they're not. Uh, and they 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 they, they oh, you know, so wouldn't be able to afford that. We can't put the prices up for them. They're a good customer. They don't see it holistically as a business with overheads and staff to pay. Hmm. Quite right. And um, the other part of it where um, we bought shares mainly, but we did do one asset purchase and the cost of doing that for us was fundamentally lower because we didn't use a lawyer. Um, So we probably spent about around about 100 grand in legals so far. Okay. Um, And, you know, that's it's not overcharged. It's it's legitimate work for the type of transactions. Um, had we and that includes all your of your lease work as well i, yeah, I yeah, guess isn't yeah, it yeah. yeah yeah there's quite a bit of lease work yes um i would say we only, we've only taken over one that had a, a good enough lease at the beginning um sort of thing. okay so so that includes the because conveyancing is actually a, a, a lengthy process in the uk yeah you know, getting the property lease sorted so i can see where a lot of that fee those fees would be spent yeah yeah um and in fact, even if we, uh, th- to be fair, they would have been, those fees would have been due in asset purchases anyway. Um, yes, that's true. Uh, so, and, and possibly even a little more because you'd be doing an assignment. Correct. Possibly. Yeah. Yeah. Possibly. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, so let's um, let's come back to the pricing uh, piece. It's interesting that you said that you walked away from a deal where the you couldn't do anything with the prices because there is a. A, a very um, uh, well-established school of thought that when you are selling a business, you don't want it to be too perfect because the new owner wants to see how they can make an impact and get some quick wins, as you yeah. as you put it. So they've perfected their business and they want a perfect price hmm. for it, uh, which isn't really the game that we're in, is it? No. Uh, and to be fair, because I've decided to... I've modified your... Most people are doing what you're doing. It's buy, build, and sell. Um, we might sell it, partially sell it to management teams. So it's slightly different, more along the lines of your the guy who's buying the funeral directors, who's yes, got James. his two hundred years vision. Yeah. Um, and I found that quite inspiring, actually. But uh, because I'm doing this partly for interest, and don't get me wrong, a business has to make money, otherwise it's not healthy. Um, so of course it needs to make money, and potentially will be saleable. Uh, we've decided if we do, it'll be to management team. Or even a partial sale to management team. I'm okay. quite relaxed about a partial exit. Um, so the so the business that I've described in a year's time, we might well have taken it um, because they've got really good management team. But right now, today, the, the management team I've got aren't up to uh, taking over at that level of business today. Got in it. a year's time, they would be. Okay, so let's talk about management team because, again, this is a theme of so many conversations I'm having at the moment, because when you buy one business, well, you know, the, the existing team just carry on doing what they're doing. When you're buying multiple businesses, the strength of the, the management team is paramount. And you probably have heard my anecdote, how I lost a, a very nice <laughs> private equity deal off the back of weak management. Yeah. Uh, so I've learned my lesson. I've learned my lesson in a, in a very expensive, very expensive way. Um, and I won't be making that mistake again. No. But tell us about your management team, how you found them, who who they are, who, the component parts of that management team and what they what they do day to day. OK, well, I'll tell you about the first one. And this was way ahead. So what I've done, uh, I got it, the vision here is to build a professional main board. Um, and I was expecting people to come out of the practices. So the first practice we bought... Um, it was an unusual, surprising one. Um, one of the associates, so I made a point of talking to all of the senior associates, uh, fee, fee earners personally at mm-hmm. the beginning. 
and now other people are doing that part but at the beginning I made a point of talking to those people and saying this is what the vision is and making it clear that I wanted them to be part of that. So you actually had individual conversations with every member of staff? No, all the senior fee earners. So anybody okay. that had been there for, that was more than five years qualified. Um, okay. Uh, sort of thing. That and that's the distinction in your sector, is it? Yeah. That, that, yeah. Okay. Got it. Um, and or practice managers for obvious reasons. Um, so uh, they're key to what we're doing as well. And the one of those associates uh, mentioned her partner to me. He was at the time working in Ireland. And she was working in the in Hertfordshire, and uh, uh, said she'd love me. Uh, she uh, she mentioned uh, he, how eminent he was. He lectures across Europe in his field, uh, and also was part of a, a practice. But they they got a decision to make about whether they're going to be in Ireland or in 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 England. And I said oh, I'd love to meet him. He sounds it sounds amazing. Two weeks later, she'd organised it. He's now our um, osteopathic director. Oh, fantastic. And because he was made, it was one of those, it was too early for us, but he was very happy to compromise uh, because of the fact he wanted to relocate anyway. Mm -hmm. So actually, and he's really enjoying it a lot. Uh, the, the osteopathic world, they're mainly used to being self-employed and we brought him in on a salary. Sorry for interrupting your video, but I wanted to introduce you to a great lawyer in the UK who can get your deals done for you. He's worked for 50 of my mastermind clients in the last few months alone. His name is John Andrews, and I've got his details right here in my little black book of contacts. You can phone him on 0345 241 2494, or you can email him on johnandrews.deallawyer at jmw.co.uk. If you want someone who can get a deal done, he is your guy. So let's get back to the video. His responsibility then is to take care of everything that is in everything and anything that's related to the provision of the service. Correct. OK. And to deal with regulatory side of it as yeah. well. Um, which you don't want to be doing, do you? No, and the mentoring training, which I'm not competent to do, sure. um, and, uh, develop career development, that sort of thing. Sometimes the, the fastest way to find the right people is to not be able to do it yourself. <laughs> because if you, if you can do it yourself, you're tempted to, oh, I'll, I'll help out in the short term. Before you know it, you've got yourself a full-time full -time job. Well, also, um, he was very relaxed and actually was quite pleased. I said, well, we can phase it um, because it, for the practice he was leaving, it's hard to replace somebody of that calibre. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So he actually left them over a six to eight month period, gradually cutting down there and increasing with us. Uh, would I take him anywhere? I probably would, but it would have put quite a strain on the overhead. Got him. Okay. So is he therefore able to look after all of your upcoming acquisitions? I mean, what size can In, the business be before you need two of him? I don't think you would need two of him. He's very, very eminent, but the uh, certainly he would need some assistance. I think he would probably 10 practice over 10 practices in his area um, and at the moment we've got one and one coming through uh, and there's another side which is a physio side which is uh, we've got more of so, so let me ask you then John so so are you therefore looking at this in in specific geographies no I went national and then followed what happened um, I I've got a story for you on the geography and I know you have too but the the in the telecoms business and ISP business that we set up, we actually set up a sub-dealer network and we were based in Norfolk and uh, we thought, well, we'll go as far as the Midlands. Well, uh, the word went out and the first inquiry was from Glasgow and the second inquiry, but it was an introduction from a major supplier. And I thought, oh, if we turn that down, they're never going to put another one out, mm -hmm, are they? Mm -hmm. The second one was in Yeovil. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> so we ended up filling the gap. It did end so up like, like a ten-hour travel uh, travel time the, between the two. And I'm not saying don't <laughs> don't be geographically specific. It, it's much easier if you are. Yes. Um, what I've done is I've made a point of I won't buy a business if I don't think they can stand on their own two feet very quickly. Yeah, so, so therefore, the geography becomes less important. Exactly. It? Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah, I, I I completely agree. If you've got weak management and it can't stand on, a, on its own two feet, all it will do is drag down the rest of the group. Yeah. All it would do is suck time and effort and energy and probably money to fix it. All, probably, the, all of those. Yeah, better not to buy it in the first place. Yeah. And to be fair, stuff happens as well. 
I missed one of the questions you said was important on the one where the reception team left. I forgot to ask the question of uh, are people related? Ah, yes, one of my favourite yeah. uh, subjects. So, yeah. <laughs> when it happened, I thought, looked at it and thought, oh, I'm supposed to ask that question. <laughs> so, so, well, they were sisters or something? Uh, mother and daughter. Mother and daughter. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So one leaves, the other one obviously follows, and yeah. two people gone. Yes, I've um, I've had similar situations, and you're often caught out when they have different surnames, <laughs> and it doesn't even occur to you to sort of question the relationships. No, um, no, I, I must admit it was uh, that that was an interesting one. Yeah. Or when when the seller's relative is still working in the business, and they're actually quite influential in that business. And you think that the seller's gone and you've got now a clean sweep to do what you want, but you've got the, the seller's daughter yeah. who's influencing everyone behind the scenes. I haven't had that yet, but no doubt that'll come. Yeah, one knows. day. One day. <laughs> <laughs> it's inevitable. So so that's that's really interesting. So um, who else is in your management team? Do you have an FD? Yeah. A CFO? Um, I've got a qualified accountant who's an FD. He actually FD'd for me in the previous business that I sold. Um, um, oh, very good. So, so you've got that trust already. Yeah, he's Wonderful. very, very strong on the operational finance um, and really good with suppliers if they need sorting out. Um, and then I've got a guy who I've known since university who's run, uh, been FD of a really big £100 million a year company. He's doing two days a month um, as a CFO doing strategic finance. Okay, wonderful. So it sounds like you've got that sorted and and I, I would assume that apart from the, sort of the standard management accounts, are you getting some sort of cash flow forecasting? Yeah. So the cash flow is reasonably close uh, 12 months out. And then, as you know, it's a story after that, really, isn't it? Yeah. Sure. So we, we ask for um, management accounts within three weeks of month end, but we also ask for sales um, within a week of month end. We did consider going to weekly, but to be honest with you, uh, holidays and stuff like that make such a big difference to the revenue, as in therapists' holidays. Okay. It, it, we, we think it's, it's irrelevant and, to look and at weekly. Are you, do, your, do your locations take cash or is it card only? Some of them did and we've stopped that. Yeah. Uh, two reasons. If you looked at the amount of cash they were taking, it was tiny. Sure. So the and time involved bank in banking it, it yeah, is actually yeah, yeah. probably costs you more than the money you've collected. Absolutely, absolutely. So, so I suppose, um, and I'm thinking of um, uh, of Alison. Do you, do you know Alison in Mastermind? I've met her. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so she's just bought a hardware store, mm -hmm. and she can see on her phone the payments as they come through. Yeah. So every day she can see the balance of of income. Are, are you in that position where you can actually look at a at an iPad and see? The, the 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 fees as they appear oh we could do yeah but because of the underlying information data you'd need uh, to do with the fee because obviously that's that's footfall if i haven't got a therapist in because they're on holiday or two therapists out on holiday um that that's uh, that immediacy doesn't really help okay it's the it's the trend in the pattern so over a quarter a rolling quarter um then the number of uh, appointments that have been made um, that's 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 important data, and that t that tells us whether the trend is changing or not. Yeah, very very good. Um, so, uh, what about HR? Because you must be your your staff count must be uh, okay. So it's um, heading upwards quite rapidly. Yeah, it's reactive at the moment. So yeah. I've got a broad approach, which is keep contract employment contracts fairly simple, mm -hmm. statutory minimum, and then if the therapy side want. Uh, uh, roles described in more detail that's not a problem for me they can do that um, and I think they do do that um, the uh, so we probably will need to develop an HR function further down the road mm -hmm. um, the I'm in two minds about it to be honest with you um, the there's a lot of they're fairly these are all fairly small family sized businesses mm -hmm. really mm -hmm. And uh, I think if we're too structured on HR, it starts to lose that feel if it's too corporate. Yeah, it's, it's knowing, isn't it, at what point you have an HR function. And it's as much as to listen to people and solve problems yeah. before they become official problems. And, and I, I've done that very badly. 
right yeah really really badly yeah. and we we never had a good hr person they always seemed to be a bit flaky but that's our fault for hiring the wrong wrong people but we never seemed to have someone who was actually on the ball and understood that we don't want uh, grievances and disciplinaries we don't we don't want any of that what we want are happy people yeah, yeah. because happy people keep the cash register ringing don't they absolutely absolutely so we probably do some low level training for because the the two key people in the practice are the clinical lead and the practice manager and some of the clinical leads are are profit focused as well some of them are completely patient focused and i'm fine with either um as long as you've got at least one of them that's got an eye on at some eye on profit and typically those two work very closely together on the people side as well. So mm-hmm. I think perhaps some coaching um, mm-hmm. uh, um, uh, uh, in that area might do enough for us. But let's, it depends how big it goes, to be honest with you. And, and do you do you run a P&L on a site-by-site basis? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and then, then we run consolidated. consolidated. We haven't got a consolidated accounts package as such. So we do a bit of work behind it um, to pull it together. But... Um, but yeah, that's exactly right. And effectively, it makes it easier if, if at any point you think this practice has got to go. Well, exactly. You can make the tough the tough decisions. Yeah. And the more timely your information, the more you can spot the problem before it becomes a problem that you can't solve. Exactly right. Yeah. 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 Very good. So, so what else, John, could you share that you've discovered along the way that in some ways maybe you wished you'd known earlier on but you discovered from experience i think the speed it's not just the speed of doing the deal it's the speed of engaging with the practice is really important Mm -hmm. so and we've actually changed the timing of when we'll do deals now because of that uh there was in fact we've recovered the situation but we bought a practice where the owner was getting married going on honeymoon um and uh the and it was uh, we actually completed it in July, and most of our senior people were taking holidays during August. Okay, and then the two, including me, who probably mm. would have picked it up, then got COVID. Right, right. And so there's probably a three month gap before there was any significant engagement. Right. Now we did yeah. we did do remote engagement, um, but it's just not the same. You need it's somebody not. to be there. To, 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 to talk through some it, things people actually find the business that they work for being sold quite traumatic yeah it's a sense of loss of disconnection to the exiting owner and if they had a good relationship with that owner they are very concerned yeah and they they need a cup of tea and a and a hug yeah um and without that they they fill that void with gossip and gossip typically is negative, <laughs> yeah, isn't yeah, yeah. it? And they make up their own stories, and they you you become the 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 the, the corporate who's just taken them over and clearly doesn't care because when was the last time we saw someone from head office down here? <laughs> and and that is the conversation, you know, whether it's you're buying restaurants or buying hairdressing salons, doesn't matter what you're buying, it's exactly the same conversation every time. Yeah, and to be fair, some of the remote technologies help. Um, but even so, I think early. And uh, the other one is um, probably the second practice we bought. Uh, we There were two really good people in there. We did keep one of them. We'd, and the, we'd acted fairly quickly to say what we wanted. Uh, we dithered a little bit with the other one who was in two minds about what their, their future was going to be anyway. And a mm-hmm. year later, they've left. Uh, so I think we should have put an offer on the table quicker and probably, but not certainly, would have kept them. Yeah. And yeah, would would you not agree that you, you kind of store all this information up and you say, I'm not going to make that mistake again. Sometimes you have to make a couple of times before <laughs> before you realise that it even was a mistake. Yeah. But you start to finesse the approach, don't you? And yeah. start to create something that works for you. Yeah. And I think everyone in, in Mastermind is different, aren't they, in the terms of their their approach and their angle. But it's when you find that approach that works for you then it's a case of, yeah, how do we find more deals? How do we fund more deals? How do we grow our management team to take care of these integrations? And then, yeah, I realised that you're 
have a different exit plan in mind to, to some people, but how long do we want to do this for? Yeah. You know, is this a three year plan, a five year plan, or like James with his funeral care businesses, is this a, a, a an in, intentionally a family business? But generation after generation. Now, to be fair, it's probably easier to say that with funeral care because <laughs> that's not going away, is it? Well, also, um, so we haven't rebranded Interesting. the practices. Um, and it, we were going in thinking that was the right thing to do and then sat down with the two first owners, both really good practices, both still really good practices, and uh, had conversations with them about it. And it was apparent that the only value would be potentially if we were selling to corporates or something like that, possibly a value if you were um, looking for a trade sale. Um, mm -hmm. I think it probably would make a difference to that. But the from the customer point of view, it was only going to raise unnecessary questions. Agreed. Agreed. Absolutely agreed. I, I think that the only time you do an instant rebrand is when there's a problem. Yeah. And you want to distance yourself from the problem. Yeah. But then you also have to ask yourself, is that sort of business I want to buy anyway? Yeah. So if you're doing turnarounds, it's it's not an issue. Um, you know, change of name is probably a good idea. Yes. Um, but whereas I'm specifically, um, by mistake, we got one that turned out to be a turnaround. But um, of the rest, none of them are turnarounds. And the uh, really the reason for that was we wanted to keep it head office light. Um, so effectively keep them healthy. Yes, make some evolve them, um, sort of thing. And so it's not revolution; it's evolution. Yes. Um, and uh, if to be fair, if uh, any other ones that were a mistake, we'd probably act a little bit quicker. Mm -hmm. um, no, to be fair, we did act pretty quickly um, on what we needed to do. Um, and in fact, the strategic recru early recruitments I'd made, I probably couldn't have dealt with one of them without the people I'd brought in. That would have been that really would have been a nightmare. Um, sort of thing. Um, on, on the point of sort of, uh, of of integration and back office and 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 rebranding, I was with a um, a former mastermind client. I think it was on mastermind in twenty nineteen, uh, a couple of weeks ago, and he's in the domiciliary care sector, and he was saying that the big acquirer in domiciliary care, which is a non UK company, but they're buying lots in the UK, they are not even even attempting to integrate hmm. so they might buy a group here and a group there and there's going to be some overlap in that there's two offices that are effectively competing with each other in the same town yeah you would yeah consolidation says you close one of the offices you immediately save yourself a lot of money that yeah. goes straight back to profit they're not even doing that okay. they haven't got time to do it they're doing <laughs> so many acquisitions it's just they basically buy 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 um, and if we do have time, we'll do it in the future. But right now, we don't. Hmm. I think I would say on that point, actually, the, the so I've slowed down a little bit now, but that you do need to work pretty hard quickly to get to a critical mass, in my view. I agree. And it's different depending yeah. on the size of businesses that you're buying. So if you're buying a multi-million pound business, you probably can spend a little bit of time before you do the next one. Yeah. But if you're buying the smaller ones, Absolutely. as I am, then you need that critical mass. Otherwise, you, you can't put the management in. Exactly. You've got you've got to get to a point where it it needs that management team and it can afford that management team. Otherwise, what happens is you get dragged into it. Yeah. Well, I don't mind sharing with you. We're just about to move into profit. So I put in overheads faster uh, than most people would. Yes. And that's partly to do with the fact that if necessary, I'm pro I'm prepared to part fund it. So it's broadly on the principles that you've advocated. But um, if I'm taking a view which is more to do with my comfort, then uh, I'm, I'm no, prepared I agree to with pay you. for that. No, I think I think you've done I think you've done the right thing because getting management in place ahead of requirements and also in your case then ahead of affordability yeah. was the right thing to do. Otherwise, you might get so frustrated by this you might not even do it anymore mm. but now you've got the the structure in place the infrastructure you've got the foundation in place so now every new acquisition should be reasonably straightforward and hassle-free for you yeah and that counts for a lot that has a that has a monetary value yeah. hassle-free doesn't it yeah and the uh so we did i think about after a third deal we reviewed the due diligence questions and cut out a load 
Mm-hmm. Because we've looked at them and thought, well, actually, we're not using this information. Yeah. So you slimmed down the requirements, probably made that process a little bit faster. Yeah. Less stressy for the seller as well, because no one likes going through diligence. No. And also they get quite narky with you about the anything they think is double, uh, you know, d- d- asking the same question twice or even, even, if, it isn't, even yeah. if it isn't, they are um, sometimes a bit narky about it. Or they don't understand the relevance of why you're asking and feel that they shouldn't answer it hmm. unless they understand the relevance. So, John, people watching and listening to this quite often haven't made the leap to their first acquisition. They've they've nibbled around the edges. Yeah. They've watched a lot of my free content or listened to the podcast, watched the videos on YouTube, but haven't actually pushed the button and done the next step. What would you say to those people having been in that position yourself a couple of years ago okay well i i didn't either i did the course um and i was exhausted after selling a business Mm -hmm. um and Mm -hmm. i looked at my energy levels and i thought okay i've done the course i want to do this but i'm not going to do it right now um and the when i did do it i actually went out immediately with uh, i think it was two thousand letters and it was shortly after lockdown, so I have to say the response for that mail shot was much higher than, than it was for subsequent yeah. ones. So um, the uh, I would say lots of letters and filter. Uh, to be fair, at the beginning, maybe maybe stage them, um, but still send a lot of, a lot out and start start to build your criteria for. Okay, you start to learn a lot more about the sector you're going into, unless you already knew about it. Mm-hmm. Um, so you start filtering and, and uh, you can't filter if you haven't got a lot of information or a lot of prospects. Yes. So some of them are going to be a, clearly on a turnover level will be of no benefit whatsoever. That's that's a fairly easy one. But so too low. Yeah. yeah. But but then w- once you start getting used to reading the accounts and stuff like that, you get a, f- a feeling for uh, uh, w- what the, what looks like a good deal. Mm hmm. And I would say, you know, you need a lot of a lot of opportunities in order to be able to do that. So um, I don't know if I shared with this with you, actually, I get quite a few calls um, and or dealmaker uh, LinkedIn requests and questions one to one as well as in the group. Um, so I had a couple of video calls with some of them and the I think they find it difficult to but even though you put so many people in front of them who've done it who's got the same information, which is if you don't send a lot of letters out, you won't build your knowledge quickly enough to be Mm -hmm. able to do Mm -hmm. the next lot well. So the first lot you send out, are you going to make some mistakes and and not do as well as you could have done? Of course you are. Um, But then of those people you've written out to, quite a lot of them it's not the right time, quite a lot won't respond. Um, So they're still there. At some point they're going to be selling. How else are you going to learn without doing it? Once you've got the theoretical knowledge. So so this is the equivalent of learning how to swim from a book. <laughs> and at some point, though, you've got to dip your toe in the water, jump into the pool. But it's always easier, to continue the analogy, if the lifeguard is walking around with you, just making sure you uh, you don't get into trouble. Yeah, exactly right. And uh, I've, I'm reasonably experienced in business. I'd sold a business before I took this on. But even so... Um, I, the reason I took the step was why reinvent the wheel? You've spent a lot of time and no doubt made a lot of expensive mistakes learning what you've learned. So that distilled knowledge um, really is massively beneficial. And I've tried to do that in any new project that I'm taking on. Who are the experts? How can I quickly get their knowledge? Um, and you you charter it, which is fine because i then know you've got a commitment to following through and and making it happen yeah free advice usually it doesn't go very far anyway well i had a a deal with my um, accountant who's a very close friend um and uh we agreed that we wouldn't do mates rates right i keep it on a professional footing and that way you know if you say can you put it to the top of the pile that was what i wanted yeah yeah no, uh, oh, we've got to do it. that. It's he's not going to make any money out of it. How am I, how am I going to motivate him? We agreed yeah. very early, and that worked really well for both of us. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful. John, you've been a great guest. Thank you so much no for problem. your input, and thank you for sharing uh, your your wisdom as well. 
because you've, you've been at both ends. You've, you've sold a business and now you're building another business and you know, you've done it very rapidly, but you've done it with care and caution. Um, and I think that uh, the information that you shared today is going to be so useful to our, our viewers and, and listeners. And I look forward to catching up with you at the next Mastermind session. Great. Thank Enjoy you so much. Too. Thank you. Take care.